My name is Kevin Annett, and I'm a former United Church minister, but I'm working now as a community minister in the downtown part of Vancouver with a lot of Native people and residential school survivors. Okay, uh, can you tell us what was or is the residential school program? Well, this was something set up in the 1800s by the government and the Churches of Canada. And there have been missionary schools operating for a long time, but the government stepped in and authorized them. And the Catholics, the Anglicans, the United Church ran over 100 of these schools across Canada right up until the 1980s. Probably half the children who went through the schools never came out again. They died in the, in the schools. I began to find out when I was a United Church minister in Port Alberni in 1992 when I began working there. Literally the first native home I went into, people began to tell me stories of their friends who had been killed in the local school that had been run by the United Church right up to 1973. And I heard so many of these stories that I knew that, you know, um, people obviously were making it up from the detail, the grief in their eyes. Oh, this was something that had been hidden for a long time, obviously, at least in the white world. A lot of the Native people, of course, know about this, but they were too afraid uh, to talk about it for a long time. Okay, and how did you gain the trust of the Native community so that they would open up, but you just showed up and they... Well, you know, I was doing a lot of work as a minister. I was visiting homes, taking food around to people, conducting funerals. One of the ways I found out right away about this was I had to do so many funerals of young Native people. Uh, a lot of teenage suicides, um, a lot of children dying, you know, in their crib literally. I mean, all of the effect of residential schools are ongoing. You know, the effect in the communities is so traumatic. I knew that was coming from somewhere, but nobody in the white world wanted to talk about it. This was before the lawsuits began against the churches brought by the survivors of the residential schools. So the attitude of the churches is, and I was told this numerous times by church officials, was they're just making up all these stories. They don't like us because of us coming here and taking their land, so they're just making up all these stories to make us look bad. That was before the lawsuits, that was the attitude of the churches. Wow. Okay, and um, uh, you've probably already answered this, but uh, did you believe what you were hearing at first and what convinced you? I think you answered that. Well, I, it was hard to believe at first because I was, I was compelled to realize that my church that I'd been raised in, the United Church of Canada, had been responsible for the death and torture and, and abuse of thousands of children who were buried in graves all over the country. So that's kind of a hard mental leap to make when you've been raised in a certain way to view things as, uh, you know. And, but then after a while I had to, had to accept it and at that point that's when I began to run into a lot of trouble because still today most of the people in, in the white world in Canada don't want to accept these things. And instead of accepting it and looking at it, they tend to blame me or deny it or get angry. Uh, and that was the first response I got from the church. Okay. Uh, how many of the schools in the residential schools program were involved in the abuse? How widespread was it? It was completely widespread. You know, I've since 1996, when I began to document these stories, I've interviewed probably, I would estimate, over 2,000 people um, who survived these residential schools. And in my book and documentary film, you know, a lot of these stories are, are, are described. I've never talked to anybody who had a positive experience. I mean, even the people who said it was good for me, I learned the English language, I could, you know, get a bit of education. If you talk to them long enough, they, they'll admit, okay, yeah, my arm was broken, uh, you know, I saw my best friend killed, whatever. There was a systematic policy of abusing and raping children, and this was deliberate uh, practice to traumatize whole generations of, of people, because in a nutshell, that's how you get people's land, that's how you uh, deculturalize them, that's how you destroy people, that's one of the, rem the, the uh, uh, ingredients of genocide, to that kind of deliberate traumatization of the younger generation. So. I saw that, uh, I've seen that in literally anyone who ever went through school. How and why did the residential schools program end? Well, in a way it's never ended because the effect of these is ongoing. You know, a lot of the people I work with on the streets of Vancouver, homeless people mostly, the young women working as prostitutes, they're almost entirely Aboriginal. All of them are second and third generation survivors, so that means they were never in a school but their parents were, their grandparents, and they have all these the uh, symptoms of the, they had to be in the school. The abuse has carried forward? Absolutely, and it's passed on intergenerationally. That's one thing. The other thing is that the policies that the government and churches had, they're still in place. I mean, under the Indian Act, you're not a citizen of Canada. 
the death rate is 20 times the national average if you're a native person. You're 50 times more likely to be killed if you're a native person in Canada, 100 times more likely to be in prison. So, I mean, all of these things are indicative of, like, a system of genocide that's never really stopped. It's just changed its strategy, if you like. And so, you know, to give you an example of that, one of the things I, I discovered soon was that there was a policy of sterilization. There were laws brought in in Western Canada in the late 20s, early 30s, to allow the legal sterilization of any native person, especially residential school kids. Now, under the United Nations Convention on Genocide, that's one of the definitions when you're trying to stop a people from breeding. And this was without their knowledge, right? Well, it was. they had no control over it because okay. the parent had to sign a document which signed away legal guardianship to the church. Uh, so they had no legal control over their own child. And, uh, yeah, it was involuntary sterilization. The, the, the principal would pick out a child uh, and they would be sterilized. That happened to thousands of children uh, in mostly United Church hospitals on the West Coast. Okay. Um, how did you handle this the situation within your parish? You mean as I began to learn these things? Well, you know, there was... Um, my congregation had a fairly redneck element in it. There were a lot of loggers and that. The fact that I was building the church and bringing new people into it, they liked that, but they didn't like the kind of people I was bringing in. Um, they had a policy of pretty much ignoring the native people uh, during the service and after, during coffee hour. They just wouldn't mingle. And it's still like that. And, you know, can't, that's kind of like in microcosm the way Canada is, that, you know, there's these, this solitude of native people. You can grow up in the country and never meet a native person. Um, but th when I began to surface these stories of what had happened in the residential school, um, some of the people in the pew supported what I was doing about that. Uh, but even to the day I was fired, I still had a full church. Uh, I had a 90% approval rate at the, the uh, right before I was fired, 90% of my congregation and a vote supported what I was doing in, in, in ministry, like in that kind of outreach I was doing to the native community. And, um, and so what actually caused my firing wasn't disaffection among my own people in the church. It was a letter I had written about a land deal that the church had done. Um, the church had all this native land that the, that the government had given it, basically, to the early missionaries. The church then sold off the native land to various logging companies for kickbacks to church officers. And I found out about that, and I wrote a letter saying, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. That's against our policy on native land claims. We're supposed to make sure that native land in the possession of the church goes back to that native nation and not sold off to our white business friends, right? So I wrote that letter, and within four weeks, I was summarily removed from my pulpit. No charge, um, like no cause and uh, just summarily fired. And I had to agree to all these con bogus conditions, like they wanted me to take a psychiatric test without providing any proof, you know. Um, they wanted me to agree to a year retraining without pay, even though I had two children to support. You know, all these really unreasonable things. And, um, but it was clear that it wasn't just the land thing that I had surfaced, but it was the fact that I was letting a lot of these survivors speak from my pulpit on Sunday. You know, there were people who witnessed murders who were talking about it in my church. And so, you know, that didn't sit very well at all with, with the church leaders. Well, the film came out in early 2007, and I can say uh, confidently that it's because of the release of Unrepentant that such a big change has happened in the last two years in Canada. To give you an example of that, there was a native member of parliament, Gary Morasti, he's a native guy from Saskatchewan. He's not an MP anymore, but he saw our film in early April, and a week later he wrote a letter to Jim Prentice, who was Minister of Indian Affairs here in Ottawa, and he said we should start repatriating the remains of these children who died in the residential school. With that same week, Prentice stands up in Parliament and starts talking about the children who died in the residential schools. That's, that triggered that event two years ago now, triggered everything. It triggered the apology, the setting up of this missing children's uh, committee that has actually never met, I don't think. They've never released any of the information on what they found. And the so-called Truth and Reconciliation Commission. All of that came out in the last two years. And the media began covering them. After years of silence, I was sharing this information for years. The media never covered it. After the film came out, uh, the Globe and Mail and others began basically quoting all my information, quoting the Dr. Bryce report showing that half the children were dying in the schools. That's become a an accepted uh, knowledge now in Canada. The Globe and Mail, uh, April 2007, they had a front page article describing that high death rate of 50%. So the film, by putting a human face on this whole story, 
it legitimated the whole issue, and it's really prompted everything we're seeing now that, uh, you know, about the government. It was inconceivable a few years ago that the government of churches would ever acknowledge that that many children died. But now that they have, they can't close that can of worms anymore. They've got to start, um, you know, answering the hard questions of where are these children buried, when are their remains going to be brought home, and who's going to be held responsible. Um, what did you think of Harper's apology on June 11, 2008? It was complete evasion. It was a way to avoid responsibility. And it was a way to exonerate the perpetrators and make sure the churches weren't held liable. If you notice when the different party leaders were commenting on, on the apology, they, I remember Gilles de Sepp, uh, referred to the mass graves of children. They were all acknowledging that all these children had died, and yet not one of them named the churches. It's like they all knew the churches are responsible for these children's deaths, and yet there's no accountability. It's like a crime happened, but no criminals are involved. And they've decriminalized the issue to one of sexual abuse and physical abuse and compensation and apology. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with crimes against humanity. We're talking about the biggest crime in North American history, the slaughter of millions of Native people under the guise of religion and education. That is a crime of genocide, and we are not holding ourselves accountable, which is not surprising because the institutions that did the crime are still in power. Many of the perpetrators are still alive. So... You know, it's not unexpected that that kind of thing would happen, but you've got to call a spade a spade. And, and uh, Harper's apology was a way to uh, uh, say, yeah, it happened, but we're not going to be held accountable. That same week, it was actually said by the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that criminal acts occurred in the school, and by that he meant murder, but there will be no criminal investigation. I mean, that's amazing. That's saying, we know the children were killed, but there's no good night would be a, a criminal inquiry. And no reason given, just no, nope. just a blanket statement that we're not going to. Uh... No, that's colluding in a crime. Yeah. Doing that. Yeah. How has the native community as a whole dealing with this issue? How have the native leaders reacted to your movie? And do you find a lot of cooperation or resistance? Well, there is in a way no thing such thing as a native community as a whole because we're dealing with many different nations and they all have their different ways of responding to this. The, the Native communities in the West were harder hit in many ways. Most of the residential schools were in the West, and they were built at a time when the plan was simply to get the Native people off the land and wiped out as quickly as possible. After the CPR linked the country in 1886, that's when the residential schools came in, and the Indian Act, that's when the RCMP were set up. Single purpose was to wipe out the Native nations and contain them, uh, like in concentration camps, which is what reserves and, and the residential schools were. So, um, it's not that things weren't bad in the East as well, uh, but there was a different strategy in the East. There was actual military alliances with the Six Nations. Uh, in the West, it was simply a plan of extermination. So you find, for example, coming in the East, a lot, I work, for example, with the Mohawk Confederacy, and, um, uh, and I find there a lot more confidence when they're talking about these issues. In the West, Many of the native groups are they're just basket case communities. I mean, most of the people are strung out on drugs and alcohol, rampant incest and violence within... When I got to Port Alberni, I only found one native family that weren't severe alcoholics. You know, I began working with that one native family. But um, there's so many uh, problems on the ground that uh, it's hard for people to be, begin even talking about the residential schools because it, it's such a traumatic history and it's still happening, right? So that's kind of the general thing we're dealing with. But um, the, the, and nevertheless, I couldn't have done the film and the book without a lot of involvement of Native people. The people who support me, the, native, the kind of Native people who support me, are those who aren't tied into the government-funded Native groups. Because invariably, native, uh, groups like the Assembly of First Nations, set up by the federal government, 600 self-appointed chiefs who aren't even elected by Native people, they, they try to speak for all Natives. Um, and it doesn't work because they pretty much just represent themselves. Those government-funded groups have a vested interest in making sure this stuff doesn't come out, in some cases because they themselves are implicated. In the residential schools, there was a strategy of picking out kids who would collaborate, informing their fellow students, give them a better education, better food, and those kids often went on and became the tribal council chiefs, you know, the people getting the government money now. They don't want that truth to come out because, you know, their role in this is going to be exposed too. So Native people are implicated in the system as well as whites. And those people tend to be the ones who are hostile to me in this work. The people who are supportive tend to be like the hereditary chiefs, clan mothers, people who are 
like the people I work with in Vancouver, homeless on their own, not accessing any of the Indian Affairs money every year, because three quarters of Native people are in that position. They live off reserve. They can't access the Indian Affairs money. They're on their own. And those are the ones who really provide a lot of support and, and the, the evidence that, that we're, I've printed and that's in the film. Okay, great. That's uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, what do you think of the media coverage on this issue? I guess that's current media coverage. Um, there, well, doesn't, there doesn't tend to be media coverage of this issue, uh, but they've been forced to. And the very fact that the Pope is forced to give some kind of pseudo-apology this week, it, it's because of this huge pressure from below. They know now, especially since the media has acknowledged in Canada for the first time that half the children died in these schools, that's opened up a lot of mouths. You know, a lot of people are talking more about what they witnessed. You know, on the CBC, and I've got this posted on my website, which is www.hiddenfromhistory.org. Um, I've got posted an interview that the CBC did last year with a woman called Irene Fable, and she witnessed, she was described seeing a little newborn baby who was the, uh, she was born from a young girl who would be raped by a Catholic priest in Saskatchewan. She saw the priest take that newborn baby and throw it live into a furnace. She stood there watching it. And, uh, I mean, when those kind of stories are coming out, the country can't ignore it anymore. So the media have, to have had grudgingly to report these things, but they tend to do it here and there. They don't do any consistent investigation. I mean, for two years now, the truth has been out now, uh, you know, legitimated in the Global Mail and National Post that these crimes happen. But what, what have we seen? Have we seen any disclosure? Have the kids been brought home and repatriated? I mean, there's, there's a consistent policy of denial and cover-up, even when these things do come out. Uh, tell us about these mass graves that have been discovered so far, and how many children would you say are in them? Well, we had, as far back as 1996, we began to document where these graves are. About a year ago, I released to the press a list of 28 known mass grave sites near former residential schools. These are known not only from anecdotal evidence, like people pointing them out. Uh, we had forensic teams go in in Port Alberni, uh, Alert Bay, a couple of places in British Columbia. And these guys on the forensic teams had been over to Bosnia. They, they had worked in mass grave situations. I remember one of them drew a little map for me of what was behind the Alberni Residential School, the one run by the United Church. And he said, this is a classic pattern of mass graves. Rows and rows of sinkholes, because when there's a grave, after a while the, the, uh, the soil sinks down in a, in a uniform kind of pattern. That's, he said, there's, there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of bodies in there in this one school. Um, a conservative estimate is 50,000 children, and probably more, because that's over a century. And to get 50,000, all you needed was five children to die in every residential school every year for a century, and you get 50,000 kids. There was a lot more than five dying every year. Uh, you know, they had a policy, uh, the, the reason the death rate was so high in the early years, and again, the Globe and Mail acknowledged this, um, the reason the death rate was so high is there was a practice of taking healthy children and housing them in dormitories with children dying of tuberculosis, then locking the door and never treating them. So deliberately exposing them, germ warfare, yeah. uh, letting them all die, cough their lives out uh, in tuber with tuberculosis. Well, the practice of deliberately housing the healthy with the dying showed that there was an intent. And you know, right now the, the, uh, the government uh, and the churches say, oh yeah, we acknowledge now that all these children died. But it happened accidentally. There was no intent involved. It was just it was poorly funded. Well, the first question you have to ask is, which they've never answered, and this is a question that's not allowed under the public uh, debate in Canada. If, if it was not intended, then how come so many died for over 40 or 50 years consistently? You don't get half the children dying year after year. Uh, you go and fix a problem. You know, you improve the conditions. The fact that they weren't improved, the fact that they kept dying at that rate shows intent. So that policy of, of wiping out children intentionally was described as early as 1907 by an Indian Affairs doctor, Peter Bryce, where he said he saw it happening. He saw the children being deliberately housed, the sick and the healthy together, and the, the church officials fudging the records to, to cover up that fact. So, I mean, it was clear right from the beginning they were trying to depopulate large areas of the West using the residential schools as a way to do it. So in relation to this issue, uh, what crimes is the government of Canada guilty of? I think 
Well, genocide, uh, mass murder, the intent to wipe out entire peoples, uh, slave labor, uh, gang rape, torture, sterilization programs, medical experimentation, uh, all of the things that you could try the Nazis with, that happened in Canada uh, for a larger scale for a longer period of time. So definitely we have the right to call it genocide. And it's a regime that's still in power. Absolutely. In 1950, the United Nations passed these things called the Nuremberg Legal Standards, and it, it, was, it was a legal code based on what had gone on in the Nuremberg trials. And the Nazis were tried not for genocide, they were tried for waging a war of aggression. And that became a crime. So these legal statutes passed in 1950 said that if you're a citizen of a country that's waging a war of aggression against an innocent nation or nations, you have the obligation to not pay taxes, to not support that country, because then you're, you're complicit in a crime against humanity. That's the situation we're in Canada. Canada's waging a war of aggression against Afghanistan, a country that was not threatening it. Canada's guilty of what the Nazis were accused of in Nuremberg, just on Afghanistan alone. But it, since 1492, we have waged a war of aggression against indigenous nations here. Canada and the U.S. are all part of that. Instigated in many ways by the Catholic Church through their papal laws, which authorized and gave sanction to the conquest of, of non-Christian people. Um, that war of aggression has been going on for over 500 years and Canada is up to its eyeballs and its agencies like the RICMP, they're up to their eyeballs in guilt for these crimes. So, no, under international law it has no legitimacy and we have the right as Canadian citizens to not support that regime. We have the duty not to. So, you know, withholding taxes, not engaging in any kind of support for these churches and government, that isn't just our right, that's our duty under international law or we can be accused of being complicit in war crimes. Yeah, we're just as guilty. Okay, what is the Republic of Canada? Well, the Squamish chiefs and some other clan uh, elders and, and others on the West Coast uh, basically are saying that, you know, we have to get rid of the crown. The English crown is the, the cause of this. The crown owns all the land in Canada. That's the whole legacy of, of colonialism and, and genocide. And if you really want to end genocide, you've got to get rid of the institutions that caused it. And we're talking the mainline churches and the, the Crown and the Government of Canada. So they say what we need instead is a new political arrangement where we can have a federation within a general republic. You break ties with the, the, the Crown, you declare independence, you declare yourself a sovereign republic, and you, ident you recognize the sovereignty of all these different nations and create a federation so that we can be on an equal footing with the native people for the first time. That was, uh, you know, something that, that plan is incompatible with the political arrangement of Canada now. So I think if we're serious about getting rid of genocide, instead of just patting people on the head and giving them some money, it doesn't change anything. We have to uproot the cause, and that's one of the main causes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> recently you were um, approached, shall we say, by the RCMP in Vancouver. Um, can you give us a background as to what that was all about? I've read the email where mm -hmm. I got the description, but I'd like to hear from you. Well, the RCMP harassment against me started in 1996, where I was threatened directly by Paul Wilms, who was head of the, uh, Sergeant Paul Wilms of the RCMP in Vancouver, head of the RCMP task force, and he threatened me not to keep making allegations of the children who had died. Uh, but the most recent thing that happened was um, I was... Given an e uh, sent an email by Corporal Sabrina Mill of the Major Crime Section of the RCMP in Vancouver, and she said she wanted to bring me in for questioning about some material on my website, but she wouldn't say what that was. So uh, I wrote her back and I said, well, if I'm going to be questioned, you can do it in a public forum where you answer questions too. For example, why is the RCMP not declared these residential school gravesites crime sites? Why are you not investigating? Um, and why has the RCMP actually been named as being part of the, the attacks and the disappearances of Native women that are going on today in BC? Eyewitnesses describe seeing RCMP women taking, RCMP uh, officers taking Native women out to the Picton farm. Uh, there's over 500... Robert, 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 Robert Picton, Picton and Willie Picton. Okay. Uh, there's over 500 missing Aboriginal women. The RCMP say there are nine. Uh, but we've documented over 500 names of Native women who've gone missing. The RCMP have a whole history of violence against lots of groups, but primarily Native people. And they were created with the intent of wiping out the Native nations in the West to clear away for the, the Canadian Pacific Railway. So they're a 
the RCP are a specifically genocidal institution, and you're going to ex expect them to act this way. So it's not surprising that one of the few people in the country who looking into their crimes, that is me, is going to be targeted by them for you know harassment and that. Um, so you know, my response to them is to say, well, you you are the one who need to be brought in for questioning, and we want you to do that in public forums where, where uh, you have to answer these these hard questions. You've said that twice that the uh, RCMP was created uh, specifically for the genocide. What proof do you have on that? Do you have documents? Do well, have in the charter, the founding charter, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police in 1874. They talk about, uh, they use the same rhetoric as the missionaries do, in, in which they talk about civilizing the West, uh, making it habitable for uh, Her Majesty's subjects, all of these things which in practice um, meant, uh, you know, as the railway expanded West, the, the practice was to clear on 50 miles on either side any native settlement. Uh, I mean, that's one of the definitions of genocide in the United Nations Convention. You uproot people uproot. and destroy the yeah. land base. That's a genocidal act right there. Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, the, it's in the, the statements and it's also in the, the acts. Okay, great. Um, okay, and now there, was there also some talk of uh, one of these mass graves being destroyed, like that they were covering her? Well, in Edmonton, behind the United Church School there, the Edmonton Residential School, uh, there's been some recent excavation uh, by the government. In the Port Alberni School, on February 10th of this year, they tore down the last building remaining. And it was a site that for years we've been telling the, everybody that there's children buried under that, that building. Nevertheless, you know, we went to the RCMP in, in Port Alberni and they refused to set, declare it a crime site. They refused to even go out there and do any investigation. That's, uh, by doing that, they're colluding in a crime. They're saying, yeah, we know it's a site, but they're not going to do anything about uh, destroying a crime site, destroying evidence is a crime under the law. So they're committing that crime, the RCMP, by allowing that to happen. Yeah, by not stopping it. Yeah. Okay, so this is going on in the West. As, are there similar mass graves in the East? Yeah, we in the list I mentioned, the 20 grave yeah. sites. Uh, to give an example, one of them is uh, the oldest residential school in Canada is called the Mohawk Institute in Bradford, Ontario. When I went to speak there once, and I'm going there later this week actually, um, you look out behind the school and the old stone building is still standing. It's a very uh, scary place because on the bricks, on the back wall, you can see the graffiti of the children who were there and they preserved it. And there's things like, help me, uh, you know, like in children's scrawl, it's a very haunting place. But an old woman pointed to all these trees and she said, whenever a child died, they planted a tree on top of the grave you know, to hide the, the evidence, and there's hundreds of these trees all over. So uh, that's one of the sites we mentioned, and in fact, it could be a site for a forensic investigation. But uh, most of the schools are in the west. The, these were all over Ontario as well, though. Um, there was a few in the Maritimes, but it was primarily Ontario and west of there. And there's certainly grave sites, you know, Lakehead, uh, you know, the Bay. Um, uh, yeah, all over southern Ontario, I mean, you find these schools. And, but just on the RCMP as well, they, the reason I meant to mention as well that they're so determined to keep this stuff buried is under uh, the Indian Act in the 1930s, they were actually deputized and made the police arm of the residential school. So they were the ones, it was the Mounties who would go in and clear out all the kids in a native village and bring them into the school. They were the ones who would hunt down the children when they ran away. They were the ones who dug the graves in many cases and, and, and hid the evidence. So. You know, they're, uh, they're very complicit in this, so naturally they want to conceal that. Wow. Okay, well this is definitely important. Um, <clears throat> the cover-up. The cover-up's been going on for, well, the thing's been going on for over 100 years. I'm, I'm assuming the cover-up probably started about the 70s. Um, can you talk about the uh, memo that the current Pope um, mm -hmm. wrote? Yeah, I think the Vatican is the real cause, ultimately, of all this stuff. And the guy who's in now, Joseph Ratzinger, when he was a cardinal, he was head of something that's the modern-day version of the Inquisition. He uproots uh, dissidents within the Catholic Church. But part of that job was uh, to contain... Um, he's the, kind of like the, he was the damage control expert in the Catholic Church. So he actually sent a letter to all of the Catholic bishops in America. <coughs> when their first exposure began about all these lawsuits against Catholic priests in Boston and Los Angeles for sex, you know, sexual abusing children. 
when that began to come out, he sent a letter ordering all bishops and priests on pain of excommunication to conceal evidence, to silence the, the victims and the uh, perpetrators, and, and to cover up this whole thing. So by doing that, he committed a major crime. He was telling people to destroy evidence and conceal these crimes against children. And not to talk to And not to talk about it. Uh, and, you know, to threaten excommunication to a Catholic is a pretty serious thing. It, it said basically, yeah. you go to hell or you break the law. You know, you've got to choose which, which you want to do, right? And um, so by doing that, he opened himself up to being charged. And in fact, there are some lawyers in America who have been trying to get Ratzinger extradited out of Rome and stand trial in America for what he did. Now, for him to turn around this week and to pretend to apologize to residential survivors, how can you apologize when you're still doing the crime? If a child gets abused, it doesn't have to be a native child. Any child in a Catholic church is sexually assaulted by a priest today. They would have to bury that evidence. They would have to conceal that because of this order from this Pope. So if he's serious about apologizing, he'd get rid of that policy that that say where the children are buried. They'd dis, you know they'd surrender those responsible. They'd revoke not only that but the papal laws which authorized the conquest of the New World, you know which gave legal sanction to everything that went on over here. They haven't done any of that, and it shows that it's, a, it's an empty, empty words coming out of Rome. What was his actual apology? What was he saying? He hasn't done it. Uh, he's going to do it tomorrow okay. Okay. on the uh, 29th of April. Uh, but um, we'll see. But you know, it's not going to. It's not assuming any, any responsibility. It's not saying that yeah, these policies are wrong. We're just sorry that you know you're feeling that way. It's kind of. It's kind of like we're sorry of, we got caught. Yeah, <laughs> basically. I mean, one of the native women who comes into my radio program said it's like I I've been abused a lot of my relationships, and every time my abuser would come to me and say, "Gee, honey, I'm sorry," and then he'd rape me again next week. I mean, that's exactly what what I think the the practice of organized religion is. Well, they're not really sorry for anything, but they realize now they have to go through the motions uh, because this is a huge, this is the biggest crime in history, you know. Just in terms of the body count, we're talking tens of millions of people. That's a Holocaust far bigger than what the Jews suffered in Europe. Uh, I mean, it's all part of the same thing, I think. I'm not trying to say theirs is any less, it's, but... It's part of the Aurea program. Yeah. yeah, and it's the biggest genocide in history, and yet it's not seen as that. And because it was our genocide, so we can't acknowledge that even mentally. Is it like a dirty little secret that Canada has to try to protect our name? Or it's a dirty it big just... secret. It's... it's um, yeah, because Canada relies on tourism and trade in a big way, and, and we've been asking people to boycott, you know, boycott the 2010 Olympics in British Columbia to, to bring that kind of pressure to bear. Canada's never going to hold itself accountable or indict itself in a court for what it did any more than the churches are, so we have to make have that happen in other ways. What are your next steps? Like what? Well, you know, public education is a big thing. I mean, you wouldn't be having these apologies coming out unless there was that awareness growing. With the internet now, which is our main tool, alternative media, the internet, groups like yours, um, that's the way this has gotten out. Probably millions of people have seen our film Unrepentant by now because of the internet uh, and all these public showings we've been doing. So that's the first step, you know, educating. Second step is action, you know, public and political action. Um, you know, we've started campaigns to ex expose the grave sites, to identify them. A lot of the work is taking down the stories from people and documenting the evidence and starting international campaigns to just um, force disclosure. Uh, eventually what we need is a war crimes tribunal set up by international bodies that come in and put Canada and the churches on trial. Now, the other thing that's being put forward along those lines is Native nations are now talking about setting up their own courts, not relying on the white courts at all, but just setting up their own traditional courts they know the perpetrators are still alive. They go arrest them and bring them and try them according to their own traditional uh, laws. And that's how they get justice, doing it themselves. So that's all part of the whole struggle for sovereignty and real justice. You're not going to ever get justice from your oppressor, especially when they've got so much to still hide. You know. What about, um, I mean, Canadians, we pay taxes, um, which means we feel this system. Mm -hmm. um, could not some kind of... of um, repentance come from the people of Canada, the white population yeah. of Canada, who are still largely unaware of what's going on. Could we not take it upon ourselves to go and ourselves arrest and indict those within the system? 
Sure, under common law, if you have knowledge of a crime, it's your obligation to make sure that person is brought to justice. And if the court system is not doing it, you have an obligation to do it yourself. So I would say very much, it isn't just Native people doing this. They're only 2% of the population. They, they need the 98% of us who are, you know, once we become aware of this. So I'd say yes, definitely, that kind of work. And withholding taxes is a big one, too, because we should not be fueling the system that's continuing to cause this, you know, rape of resources and loss of land and, and you know, all of these other crimes that, that are still being done. I mean, we're affected by this, too. We drink the same water. We, we're, we suffer under all of this as well. So I would say all of those things are needed, yeah. How have you seen the, the power of uh, the Internet, the alternative media, uh, taking over? As, is, it's driving the agenda now, is what I Well, I, I'd say, just from my limited experience on this issue and, and everything, it couldn't have happened without the Internet exposure we've been getting. All the, the invitations to come and speak on campuses, in communities, 90% of that comes because of people seeing our website, uh, hearing me over co-op radio in Vancouver and the alternative media, you know. So it's had a tremendous effect just on this one issue. So if you know what's happening on this one issue that way, then certainly on everything else, it's, you know, I agree. And there's a lot of parallels between 9-11 and, and this, you know, investigating genocide because it's really the same crime. Uh, you know, 9-11 occurred because of this whole... Uh, the American Empire and its wars of aggression and the need to conceal that. Well, that's what I'm going through too. This is like the domestic version of it, but it's the same war, you know. Uh, America has so much prosperity because of the unlimited, seemingly unlimited resources and land that it acquired here by the destruction of the Aboriginal people. The uranium that they use in the war, depleted uranium, comes from northern Saskatchewan. It comes from a company called Camco, which has forced indigenous groups off the land uh, they dump their uranium tailings all over the native communities. There's people dying of radiation poisoning. So the war in Iraq happens here at home first. It happened against the native population. And, you know, that's... Lillian Shirt, who's on the film, she was a nurse in Edmonton in the 1950s. They were bringing down Inuit men who had... There was a thing called the Dew Line that they built, the distant early warning line for uh, NORAD. When they were digging up the uranium... Uh, their backs were disintegrating because they were carrying this uranium on these sacks and she treated dozens of these Inuit men who were dying from the inside out of radiation poisoning in the 1950s. I mean, all of this is to fuel the same war economy that's causing the war in Iraq and caused 9-11. So it's like when we see the commonality of this, we realize that we're all part of this. We're all victims and we're all need to struggle together to confront that empire. And, and the, use, the, the way the government uses the same tactics... Uh, to uh, obfuscate its actions. Parallel, I mean, the tactics they use uh, in the 9-11 concealment and in this, it's the same. I mean, you, 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 there must be a handbook somewhere about how you operate because it's really similar. It's www.hiddenfromhistory.org. It's been up for uh, uh, six, seven years now. We have our film on Repentant posted. We have testimonies from survivors, uh, a lot of updates of the work we do, um, lectures, information on our publications uh, and we're adding to it all the time so it's really an important resource it's probably the first place to begin because there's no other uh, website in Canada that has documented this stuff so completely and is really leading this fight I mean what I find it really odd is so few um, quote white Canadians are willing to really get involved in this issue uh, because it strikes at home it strikes at home so closely I think uh, you know, genocide we think happens elsewhere. It doesn't happen here at home. So it, it, it um, it's a good way to kind of educate people past that that bias and that block, just to look at the, at the hard evidence, and you can find that on the website. If someone out there has information that they want to share with you, but they're just too scared for whatever reason, ridicule, shame, whatever it is, what would you say to them? Well, I find the best way people share information is in a group. Uh, we have circles we hold on during the week in Vancouver where, uh, you know, survivors come in and tell their stories. Those who want the stories recorded, um, that's, uh, we, you know, we do that and we, we publish it. One of the smears done against me by the RCMP and the United Church is that I was using people's stories without their permission, and which is a lie, of course, but uh, it's that kind of fear they play on that, you know, your story is going to be ripped off by this white guy. And... Um, you know, to get around that, what we say to people is, look, 
we only use these stories if you want it to go public. 90%, it's like in rape cases, you know, 9 out of every 10 rape victims don't come forward. It's the same with this stuff. I mean, you're only hearing a, a minority, but that is representative of a lot of other people who can't speak uh, or find it hard right now. Although it's easier to speak, when the issue becomes legitimated and is out there more and is talked about, people feel safer to start talking. And that's why you're seeing so much change happening, because that's happening all over the country. You know, I spend a lot of my time doing that, just listening to people's stories and encouraging them. I have another site, uh, canadiangenocide.nativeweb.org, and uh, that has the primary documents on that that you find in my book. So if, you know, students especially, if they need to access those documents, there still needs to be a lot of research done. That's an important act. There, there hasn't been uh, a lot of books written on genocide in Canada. There's The Circle Game uh, by Ro, uh, C- Roland Christian, um, War Churchill, uh, A Little Matter of Genocide. But most of the academics in Canada just will not go near this topic, or they do it in a, in a very kind of superficial way. They will not look at the hard evidence of genocide. So we're, you know, there are not a lot of resources in that sense to use right now, except you know, what we're doing. You did an interview on the Alex Jones radio show. Um, earlier you said the response was pretty positive. Uh, oh, yeah. Did it give you a big boost? Or? Very much. Um, you know, just to know your four million people were listening to you after being, you know, kind of a voice in the wilderness for so many years is really gratifying. And, you know, our film has been translated into French and Italian and Spanish. It's being shown all over the world, actually. It's being shown in Italy this week. Um, and the Italian newswires have picked that up. So... Um, yeah, it's really getting around finally. Well, there's a group in Vancouver that I work with called Friends and Relatives of the Disappeared, and they have a group in Toronto as well. They've done vigils outside churches, and that's a really important action, just holding these churches accountable. That's something people can do. You can just Anywhere. hold yeah. pickets outside churches on Sunday mornings and hand out stuff with their website on it, telling the church members, did you know this? Did you know your church did these crimes? Stop giving money to these churches. Don't put money in the collection plant until they start saying where the children are buried. That's a very powerful thing for people to do. What do you hope to get out of tonight's showing of Endgame in Ottawa? Well, uh, not just the awareness spreading, but... Oh, sorry, um, re- on repentance, sorry. On repentance, yeah. Not just the educational value, but hoping that there'll be a group of people who coalesce that will work here in Ottawa with our network and will continue to do this work. Ottawa is a very strategic place to be doing this for obvious reasons. Um, but it's also important to link up with the, the uh, Mohawk Traditional Council, who are going to be doing a vigil on the 29th on Parliament Hill. These are people outside the Indian Affairs system. These are the clan mothers and others who want to really get the truth and hold their own investigation. So I think you know setting up that kind of long-term group would be really important.